So I'm Amy Greenstein, I'm with the management department at PTU, and I'll talk today about pro-social messages. And this is a plastic bottle. Key reason why we need uh, pro-social messages. I'll return to that bottle throughout my presentation. But let's start with some uh, background. So in recent years, there's a growing debate about the role that marketing plays in a variety of undesirable social behaviors and outcomes, like overconsumption, or obesity, pollution, smoking, and other bad things that happen due to intensive marketing efforts. By the way, three of these categories are directly linked to this plastic bottle, mind you. But today, uh, I'm not going to talk about the dark side of marketing, but I'll do some marketing to the marketing discipline. I'll talk about the positive side, at least of the pro-social component of marketing. I'll highlight some state-of-the-art research that how and when public policymakers and social marketers can use the power of marketing for the greater good of our society. So we could probably all easily agree that our society will benefit if we we'll drive safer, sign an organ donation car, card, uh, quit smoking, or recycle more. But it's easier said than done. While most of our intentions are probably sincere, and typically we do not follow to these desired behaviors. I'll give you two examples. So in a recent survey of a representative sample of drivers, we found that 38% knowingly drive above speed limit. In another example, in the States, well, about 60% of Americans believe it's important to sign an organ donation card. The current transplant waiting list in the state is about 114,000 people long. It's updated every day. Uh, so wh what is the nature of this paradox, of this gap between intentions and behaviors in so many pro-social contexts? I'll give you four reasons. First, it's a matter of status quo. We prefer and keep on doing what we're used to. Secondly, if we move from the status quo, costs are involved. Specifically, if you're interested in healthier choices or environmental friendly choices. Third, not always you are the direct beneficiaries of a social change. And even if you are, many of the benefits come only in the long run. This is number three. And number four, lack of awareness. Many of our behaviors, we're not aware of the side effects of these behaviors. So for example, if you sit in a restaurant and order from the menu a delicious large steak, like in Texas, right? You probably do not aware of the enormous water resources that had to be wasted, used, depending on your perspective, in the process of bringing this steak to your plate. Okay, so I'll talk today about the potential effectiveness um, of pro-social messages. I'll start with a discussion of three aspects of pro-social messages, message assertiveness, uh, the interesting effect of positive use of information, and the power of social norms. And I will conclude with a discussion of the unexpected consequences from pro-social behavior. So let's start with assertiveness. So there's overwhelming support for the intuition that people do not like to be bossed around in an assertive manner. We prefer gentle requests. However, interestingly enough, in a green marketing context, most of the ads use assertive language. Like this example, uh, it's hard to see, but this is a Greenpeace ad, and it says there, stop the catastrophe. Very much assertive. You see much less of these types of ads, which use much more gentle wording, and here it says, will only words remain? So we set out to find under which conditions gentle or more assertive um, uh, language will yield more effective compliance with um, environmental requests. It was clear to us during this re research that key to our understanding this phenomena is the importance that people attach to different environmental activities. So we compared 
between two groups of students. Agricultural students who view environmental activity very seriously and they are committed to environmental protection. And I come from the management department, but yes, management students who are less committed to environmental activity. We asked both groups about their recycling tendencies in either an assertive tone, you must recycle, and a more gentle tone, you could recycle. <laughs> the results were very clear and were replicated in a number of experiments in a number of other environmental contexts. The agricultural student came back to us and said, you know, recycling is a serious business. If you want to motivate us to act, pound on the table, use assertive language. However, if you would use a gentle tone, we would probably disregard your request. The opposite had happened with the management students. They came back to us and said, who are you to tell us what we must do? But if you will, would ask gently, yeah, we might consider. So there are two takeaways from this study. First, quite surprisingly, uh, we, we found that assertive messages might yield effective um, uh, results. And, and the other interesting insight is that it is really important to segment your target audience for pro-social messages and then target different messages to the different groups. Second big issue today is with healthy eating, right? So consumers are looking for healthier choices, manufacturers provide a large assortment of low calories type of products and an open question is whether a low fat labeling is an effective message to send to consumers. So this is exactly what Wonsing and Shandon set out to find. And they did it, they studied a, a group of people that uh, came into uh, an open house type of an event, not related to the purpose of their study. And um, at the end of the event, they split the group to two subgroups. The first group was offered new regular M&Ms. Second group was offered new low fat M&Ms. Don't get your hopes too high. These are non-existent in reality. Okay? What happened is the following. Quite interestingly, I think, uh, people in the low-fat condition consume about 30% more tasty M&Ms than the guys at the regular condition. Um, and this finding was even more profound among the group of people that can be characterized as overweight. So there are two takeaways from this interesting study. First, uh, it's really important what type of information you convey to consumers, especially uh, you should be cautious about conveying positive information like low fat. And secondly, it's interesting to see that the low fat label served as a justification for overconsumption. Remember this term, justification, we'll return to that at the end of the presentation, it's important. The last aspect uh, I'll discuss today in the context of pro-social messages relates to social norms. That is, how would your behavior change if I share with you the behavior of your neighbors or friends or colleagues? And that's exactly what Schultz and colleagues did in a field study in a California neighborhood in the context of electricity usage. What they did is to split the neighborhood to two types of households. On the right, the first household, the bad guys that consumed more energy than the neighborhood average. On the left, the good guys that consumed below the average. So the researchers were able to send two types of pro-social messages. The first, to the right, to the bad guys, a sad looking face saying, your household consumed more energy than the neighborhood average. And on the left side, smiling looking face to the good Guys, you did a good job. What happened in terms of uh, consumption following the, those pro-social messages? As you might expect, the bad guys probably thought to themselves, you know, it's a little bit inconvenient to be above average. We can make some efforts and reduce our consumption. And that's what exactly they did. But what we see here is a boomerang effect. So the good guy said, you know, we did a fine job so far, so it's time to loosen up a little bit. In my own research, we were able to replicate this in a number of other consumption contexts, all with severe negative environmental 
uh, consequences uh, from overconsumption. So, so definitely public policymakers should be aware of this boomerang effect. And it's also important to note, um, it's important to identify uh, consumers, social reference groups, those that can have a substantial influence on consumers. Okay, let's move to the last part and talk about unexpected consequences from pro-social behavior. So there's a growing recent research, mostly in, in social, social psychology, uh, that links pro-social behavior to, un, to subsequent unethical behavior. For example, this paper by Mazari and Jong finds that people that purchase green products are more likely later on to cheat and steal, okay? Think about it next time you buy organic goods. Um, but what about the clicker? Yes, but I want to talk, talk, talk to you about a project I'm involved in about the relationship between volunteering and risk taking. So we studied a group of students discussing, asking them to discuss their uh, volunteering experiences. And we were able to um, compare between two groups, those that volunteered in the last uh, six months and those that did not. And we then asked them to make a number of financial decisions, um, selecting between certain but small payoff and uncertain but more substantial payoff. Who do you think took more risk? And this is also something we replicate in a number of other contexts with, with, with a bunch of other audiences. Um, the volunteering condition led people to uh, take risky decisions. And we, we explain this as follows. It seems that when you're volunteering, you feel more secure. And this sense of security then leads you to make riskier decisions. Uh, the, the final set of findings and studies suggest that there might be unexpected consequences, sometimes negative consequences to pro-social behavior. So policymakers should be aware of that and perhaps construct different mechanisms to minimize this uh, unexpected effect. Overall, what would be the key takeaways uh, from my presentation today on the potential uh, effectiveness of pro-social uh, messages? To me, there's a key theme that emerges across the different studies that I presented, and it relates to uh, the psychological process of justification. So it seems that people would always, fi would always find the needed justification for their behavior, consciously or unconsciously. So it seems really relevant to increase awareness among consumers, among ourselves, and among policymakers about the different justification strategies that might be out there. Um, and this definitely relates to some of the examples that I shared with you today. So on the negative side, we found that people use the low fat labeling as a justification to consume more. But on the positive side, we learned that if we think that and environmental activity is important, then we use it as a justification to accept assertive language and then do better on the environmental side. A final note on plastic bottles. Um, in general, plastic bottles are bad for our society. In most of the cases, they're bad for your health and they're definitely, definitely bad for the environment. Um, and what I wanted to say about this more, yes. So do think twice, as I did just now, think twice before you purchase those products. If you do purchase those products, then recycle. But then, after recycling, beware of the justification process you might be in. So beware of cheating in exams, for example, <laughs> driving carelessly on the highway, or wasting too much more water when taking a bath. Thank you very much.